dynamical system, so it has been a great learning experience for me. Uh, so I'm going to sp uh, speak about an inverse problem uh, that I like to call Lorentzian Calderon problem. So it's some sort of version of this, this uh, very classical uh, uh, central problem in, in the field of inverse problems. And this uh, work is based on uh, joint work with Spiros Alexakis and Ali <coughs> who are both in, in Toronto. Okay, but let me uh, start by uh, recalling some uh, context here. So this is, uh, in, so th I'm going to revise something that uh, actually Fabrizio already presented, but as this is not a, a workshop in inverse problems, maybe it's a good idea to, to recall. So this is the, the classical Calderon problem. So we uh, have some bounded uh, domain, let's say in R3, with a smooth boundary, and then we have some uh, positive smooth function in the domain, and then I like to uh, formulate the problem in terms of this uh, uh, Cauchy data set of, of this coefficient gamma. And we look at the first two boundary traces of all solutions to this elliptic equation here, uh, and then uh, this somehow encodes all boundary measurements um, in, in, let's say, in electrostatics, for instance. And then uh, with Calderon problem, it's uh, given this Cauchy data set, we want to find this function gamma in the equation. And uh, the, in this classical case, this problem has been solved, so it's known that it has unique solution in the sense that if two uh, Cauchy data sets coincide, then uh, the two uh, parameters gamma also coincide. And this is a, a result by John Sylvester and Günther Ullmann from late 80s. And uh, then uh, the name comes from uh, a paper by Calderon, of course, um, where he basically solved uh, a linearized version of this problem. So this problem is nonlinear. So although this, you know, this uh, generating PD here is, of course, a sim op simple uh, uh, linear elliptic PD, the map from gamma to this boundary data is, is nonlinear. Uh, so Calderon ha ha had this uh, electro electrostatic uh, model in mind, and uh, let's have a look at that a little bit more closely. So <coughs> we, can, we can, for instance, think that this data set is generated as follows. So uh, we inject some current pattern given by some function f on the boundary of the domain. Then we measure the elect elect potential that solves this equation, again, on the boundary. And then this uh, Cauchy data set is nothing else but the graph of uh, so obtained map that is often called Neumann to Dirichlet map. Um, but I, I, I personally prefer to, to formulate the problem in terms of this Cauchy data set because it's somehow very, very brief. We don't need to introduce operators, we don't need to speak about function spaces and so on too much. And this uh, type of uh, measurements have been. Uh, used in, in, in practice to, let's say, for instance, to monitor uh, lungs of, of newborn babies. Uh, or more recently, this has been used to monitor lungs of COVID patients, so there are some research papers on the topic. Of course, I mean, the, the reconstructions, is, they are not that great. In fact, we heard from Fabrizio that, uh, that these, these problems are very bad models of continuity, but you can, uh, let's say, if there is some sort of like a collapse of lung, you can you can detect that, uh, and 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 this uh, the good side in this type of measurement model it is that it's completely harmless, and we can just sort of continuously uh, run these measurements and monitor things. So that's somehow the classical classical story. But what I really uh, want to uh, consider is some sort of geometric version of this problem and. Uh, Ultimately, I'm going to uh, have some uh, Lorentzian uh, version, but let's start with the Riemannian. So let's take one step at a time. So, uh, and this is a famous open problem, maybe the most central open problem in the in the field of inverse problems. 
So let's consider a, a compact Riemannian manifolded boundary. And we, again, we define the data set uh, associated to that manifold by, by taking the first two boundary traces of all harmonic functions on, on the manifold. And then the problem is to uh, find the manifold uh, given the Cauchy data set. Well, uh, this is not possible uh, in general, but there is this uh, natural uh, gauge invariance in the problem. So, uh, what we expect to be able to do is to find the manifold up to isometries that fix the boundary of the manifold. But this is a wide open question. It has been solved only when uh, the manifold is uh, real analytic, so this goes back to the paper by Ian Ullman in the, in the sort of simply connected case, and then uh, a follow up work by Lassus and Ullman where you have some non trivial topology. Uh, or if M is a, is a surface, but it somehow has then this, of course, this uh, hidden real analytic structure there. But uh, in this surface case, actually, the, the formulation here is not quite uh, the right one, because in 2D, there is also this conformal invariance, and you can hope to, you know, recover uh, manifold only up to this conformal and diffeomorphism invariance, and this is, of, this is the result by now. Now, in order to you know, avoid uh, these uh, differences between two and higher dimensional cases, I'm going to assume in my talk that uh, we are in three or higher dimensions all the time. This, uh, this problem where uh, we want to recover the, uh, the, the Riemannian manifold up to um, isometries uh, is, 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 is very hard. Uh, uh, presumably, at least, it has been open for a long time. So we can then consider some uh, perhaps easier problems that are still hard. Uh, so let's say that we actually know the manifold structure, <coughs> the anisotropic structure, but then there is some unknown rescaling that we want to want to figure out. So we consider some conformally rescaled, uh, so data co corresponding to some conformally rescaled metric. We know somehow the uh, the original G, and we want to just find the conformal factor. And this problem you uh, expect uh, to, to get full uniqueness, so there is no natural gauge invariance in this problem. Um, and, uh, well, um, and I will tell you a little bit later about positive results, but what I want to say uh, immediately is that you can uh, view this problem in, in a slightly different way. So instead of uh, wanting to find conformal factor, you can, you can reduce this problem to finding a zero to order perturbation in the equation that I, I call here V. And this is also something that, uh, that Fabrizio mentioned in his talk, although I mean, maybe a slight variation of this idea. But we, we can reduce this problem of finding conformal factor to the problem of finding zero to order perturbation by making some suitable uh, gauge transformation. So we replace our unknown function u <coughs> as a, a function w that is just a, a u times some, uh, some suitable power of the conformal factor, and, and this, this, this does the job. OK, so I'm mostly going to focus on this, this variation here, where we know the, the manifold, and we just want to find a potential. Okay, so, so what about then the, the Lorentzian case? Well, it is essentially the, the same formulation, except that I replace my Riemannian manifold by a Lorentzian manifold. And one can imagine that this, this Lorentzian problem is easier because there are somehow rich, uh, uh, in a sense, the, the set of solutions to a hyperbolic equation is richer than the set of solution, uh, solutions to an elliptic equation. For instance, we can use some uh, propagation of singularities. Uh, also, unique continuation theory is richer in the case of hyperbolic equations than in the case of elliptic ones. So we simply now uh, consider a, a Lorentzian manifold with, again, a boundary. And uh, to make sense of the normal derivative uh, along the boundary, let's assume that the, the boundary is time-like, which means that it looks uh, something like this. Uh, so you have um, like some sort of time axis. and uh, is topologically the manifold is like, a, like an infinite cylinder uh, extending uh, along this, this time axis. 
And yeah, then the problem formulation is, is, is exactly the same as before, so we are given the Lorentzian manifold and this Cauchy data set, and we want to find the potential. Now, there is a classical result by, uh, by Plum, and in fact, he, he mentioned this result, but no, he, he took a different point of view in his talk. Uh, so if, uh, if we are in, in, in the Minkowski space, so let's say that our manifold is, is just infinite cylinder in the Minkowski space, so it really looks exactly like this picture then, um, then uh, uh, this problem is solved by Plum. And, and I like to view this result as the Lorentzian analog of this famous, uh, or this seminal result by uh, Sylvester and Ullman that I mentioned in, this, in the first slide. So one uh, reformulation of their result is that the, the problem is solvable uh, in, an, in a domain in the, in the Euclidean phase. Yes? Sorry, can I just ask, can you just uh, say again, what, do you have some minimal like regularity requirements on V? Uh, or oh, minimal reg uh, regularity assumption on V. Yes. Yeah, I'm just assuming that it to be smooth in the, in the yeah. talk. But I mean, that is certainly not minimal. I mean, um, if you are in, uh, I, I don't think that in this time dependent case, so here, of course, this V is a function of space and time. That's basically, um, and also, of course, the geometry can uh, change in time. Um, so that hasn't been studied so much. Uh, I'm, I'm going to tell you some, some new results in that case. But if you are in a case where, you know, uh, V is time independent, then you can certainly have results like V is in L infinity and you can probably, you know, go to some uh, LP spaces. But I don't think that uh, there is anything beyond uh, L infinity. And presumably you could do something like this also in this uh, time dependent context, but I mean, that the proof that I'm going to show you maybe is not going to allow you to do exactly that. Or one would need to be a little bit careful. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I'm not going to care about low regularity in my talk. Everything will. Uh, okay, so let, let me right away you know, give a flavor of, of, of what we have proven recently. So this is just a special case, which says that we can, we can solve this problem in near Minkowski geometries in this sense that if you look at the, a cylinder, like in the previous slide, so we have some uh, contact domain with smooth strictly convex boundary in, in, in Rn. And then in this cylinder, we have some uh, Lorentzian metric that is close to the Minkowski metric, but can depend on time. Uh, in, in, uh, in, in terms of some CK, CK topology close. Uh, then uh, if we have two uh, compactly supported smooth potentials there, and the OG data sets uh, coincide, then the potentials must be the same. So what is, uh, uh, I, mean, all the, I mean, this is just a special case, but I think this is maybe the most interesting special case in a sense of our theorem because um, for instance, if you look at the Riemannian version of the, of the problem, it is open uh, in near Euclidean geometry. So you would, again, some, just somehow replace the Minkowski metric by the Euclidean metric here in this statement, and, 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 and uh, that's an open problem. So someone tells that this theory by um, Sylvester and Ullman is not uh, robust against small perturbations in the geometry. And in fact, uh, I mean, before this result, uh, all, uh, the, all these previous results in the, in the Lorentzian case also had this feature that um, the Lorentzian metric uh, is, uh, was assumed to be real analytic with respect to some suitably chosen time variables. Also, they had this sort of quite uh, in a sense rigid assumption there. And I was somehow worried about that. Uh, I mean, maybe, maybe you know, before this result, that, that you know, maybe there is some sort of hidden use of real analyticity in, 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 in the whole theory of inverse problems, but that's not the case. I mean, for PDs. Um, <coughs> yeah, and yeah so, so here we can, can perturb in, in, in C infinity or CK category, and, uh, and, and there are no symmetries or, or real analytic features in this. Uh, in this uh, when you say close to Minkowski, you mean that like the CK norm is, is close to the flat metric, or yes. that the curvature of G is close no, to the CK, CK norm? Yeah. Okay. Or um, 
Yeah, well, I mean, in that way, we make some curvature assumptions so that, uh, I mean, that's maybe the most important thing, but there are also some other technical assumptions, so you need to guarantee that those also hold. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you, uh, yeah, you need to see here. Okay. So, uh, as I said, I mean, in most of, or in all of these previous results, you assume some sort of a special structure in time variable, and that uh, perhaps the, the most classical one is that you consider this uh, type of product metric, so you have just this, you know, your manifold is a cylinder, but also your metric comes from, I mean, uh, I mean it's just a product on this, on this cylinder. And in, in general relativity, this type of uh, metrics are often called ultrastatic, so I'm going to, going to use that term here. So here, uh, we have like a, we have a Riemannian manifold with boundary M0, G0. And then, when we, then we take a product with, uh, with time interval or timeline. Uh, it's this R here. And in this case, uh, there is okay. So in the case where both your geometry and your zero to the perturbation are independent of time, we actually have very complete theory that uh, where the basic idea goes back to uh, a, a paper by by Belichev, where he developed a method to, to solve this type of problems. Is now called the boundary control method. So it's actually based on some ideas in, in control theory, in, in, in control of waves. I'll say, because what we are going to do is, is we are going to uh, develop sort of a version of this method that works in the Lorentzian setting. So I'm going to say a little bit more about this later, how this, this, this works. But then there is another, uh, another uh, classical approach. In fact, this goes back to this. Uh, result by Plamen in the, in the Minkowski case, where you use some you know, geometric optics of propagation of singularities, use your you know, favorite version of uh, microlocal propagation of singularities, um, to reduce the problem of finding uh, potential uh, to the problem of inverting the light ray transform of this potential. Of course, light ray transform was in, uh, uh, introduced in, in Plamen's talk. So you integrate the potential along all light rays, and then, you know, from these integrals, you want to recover the potential. Now, the, in this approach, the, basically in any geometry, um, let's say non-trapping, uh, maybe with some reasonable time variable, you can uh, do this reduction to light ray transform. So that's not a problem. The problem is to invert the light ray transform. And as you heard from, from Plamen, you know, it's, it's even the microlocal pictures suggest that it's hard because we are missing some. Uh, we are missing. Uh, we cannot reconstruct even all singularities in a stable way. And um, but it can be inverted in some some cases. And I mentioned one result that uh, we have with uh, Fez Mohammadi, Ilma Virta, and Kion, uh, where um, this 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 sort of this Riemannian base is uh, a simple manifold. So this means that um, uh, it's a compact Riemann manifold with boundary. Uh, the boundary is strictly convex, and uh, the exponential map is uh, diffeomorphism onto the whole manifold uh, uh, for, for any point in the manifold. Uh, another, maybe more geometric way to say this is that uh, there are no conjugate points, and uh, it's simply connected. Um, yeah, and um, well, we can do something in a, in a, in a bit more generality, but let's, let, let me not, not go into that. So, so this simple model case is, is, is something that has been studied quite a lot, and I will, I will stick with it in these formulations. Um, and, and I should mention that in the Riemannian case, if you look at this sort of ultrastatic Riemannian metric, there is just this product metric here, again on some uh, cylinder. Um, then you can solve also that, that version of the Kapuna problem, and that's uh, by Dos Santos Pereira, Koenig, Salo, and Ullman. Okay, let me, I mean, I don't want to say too much about what is often called partial data results, but let me make this small, small detour in my, in my sort of main line of story uh, here uh, to make some connections with, you know, at least a little bit of connections <laughs> to, to some other talks. Uh, in this in this workshop, so um, 
we can we can somehow consider this type of problem where we can uh, you know use sources only on part of the boundary or maybe if we look at some uh, closed manifold only on some small set on the manifold and then uh, maybe we have receivers in some other place so uh, and one one case where this type of partial data result where sources and receivers are far away uh, can be solved is, is when you have an anosov surface, so a surface with uh, anosov geodesic flow. And then you can t take any uh, two uh, open and non empty sets, S and R, where we put sources in S and receivers in R. And if we consider this, uh, uh, this sort of map that then uh, encodes measurements uh, like that with sources in, in, in S and receivers in R. We just uh, model it by solving the wave equation with so, uh, source F here, supported in S, spatially, and then, you know, solve the equation and restrict the solution in R. And then you can show that uh, this type of operator, which is the analog of uh, Dirichlet Neumann map or Neumann to Dirichlet map for closed manifolds, uh, actually determines the, the manifold up, of course, up to iso isometries. And this is uh, something that uh, we did recently with, with Matt Lassas, Meret Nur Sultanov and Lauri Ylinen. Uh, and I, I want to mention this especially because uh, our proof actually uses this, uh, this uniform, spect uniform spectral bound that, uh, that Stefan uh, presented, I think it was on Tuesday. So, so if you have this um, if you have these uh, L2 normalized eigenfunctions for the Laplacian on this manifold, and uh, if they satisfy this uh, uniform, if their norms restricted on, let's say, S uh, are, are uniformly done from below by some positive constant, then we can prove this result. It actually doesn't really matter if we assume this for S or for R. Okay. But now, uh, let me go back to the case where I have data on the full boundary and say something about the results outside this uh, ultra-static case. So there is, this, as I mentioned, there are these two, two basic approaches, and um, the boundary control method and then this, this um, method based on geometric optics. This boundary control method can be generalized to the case uh, where the, both the metric and the potential depend real analytically on, on, on some suitable time variable. So basically all coefficients in your wave equation depend real analytically on time. And this is a result by Eskin. And it uses this sort of, uh, this sort of basic building block for somehow the analytical, uh, where, the, where the method gets its somehow analytical power. Uh, uh, is this result uh, uh, by Tataru, which says that uh, for wave equations where, you, where the coefficients depend uh, analytically in time, uh, you can do unique continuation across any uh, non-characteristic surface. Uh, and what's uh, sort of amazing in this result is that there was almost like a counterexample to the result uh, even before it was it was proven. So uh, so this 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 is true if if you have this real analytic uh, dependence, but if uh, you, have, you allow for smooth dependence in the coefficients, then actually um, this type of uh, unique continuation across any non-characteristic surface can fail. Uh, the catch here is that this potential is actually complex valued and not real valued. I, I believe it's an open question if you can have counterexamples in the, in the real valued case or, uh, or maybe pre even prove this positive result in that case. Okay. Uh, and then you can also generalize this um, geometric optics based uh, approach. For instance, if your manifold is uh, real analytic, but you don't assume any real analyticity for the potential, and then you have some sort of convex foliation condition, uh, you can solve the problem. And this is uh, the result by Plamen. And I think Plamen also alluded this result a little bit in his talk. I'm not going to give any details in mine either, despite Plamen promised that I will, but I'm not. Um, and so if you have stationary uh, Lorentzian manifold as defined by Plamen, and if it satisfies certain convexity condition, 
then you can solve the problem. So what we did is that we basically did the same sort of reduction as Plamen in his talk to the, to the base, but uh, we just, you know, we knew that there is this, there is this um, theory how to, how to invert integral transforms for more general flows than, than let's say, geodesic or even magnetic. Uh, by Han Ming Chu, and we just reduced it to this theory without making the connection to, to magnetic flows, which was in retrospect, I mean, something we should have done. But, <laughs> uh, but I guess, I mean, there is still some uh, uh, something to be understood here. So, uh, so in, in Plamen's case, he didn't really study the light ray transforms so for some uh, time dependent uh, functions. So that is probably something that can be done in, the, in this direction. Okay, but in all this, in the, in all this uh, story here, um, the, the, the geometry is uh, real analytic with respect to a time variable. In this stationary case, uh, it is just independent of time, uh, whereas in these other cases, we explicitly assume real analyticity. So I'm going to say a little bit about uh, the proof of our result, and let me just uh, recall some uh, some vocabulary in Lorentzian geometry. Although I mean this is all, uh, already used a couple of times in this week. So um, so once we have this uh, inner product with uh, with sign, let's say uh, minus plus 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 uh, on the on the tangent bundle, and then uh, that bundle splits into three regions. So we have uh, what is called space-like region if uh, uh, the vector in a product itself is, is positive and in this picture it's somehow the exterior of this double cone. Uh, the light-like region where it's zero and it's the, it's the, 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 the cone surface and time-like uh, is negative and this means that it's somehow inside the cone. Uh, and there is also this word causal, which means just light-like or time-like. And then you can also, I mean, not only uh, classify the vectors according to these uh, signs, but you can also uh, classify paths. We say, uh, sort of, if, if, if at all points uh, uh, tangent vector is one of these type, then we say that the whole path is of this type. We can also this classify surfaces by looking at the normal in each point. Okay, so now let me begin by formulating the actual result that we have, not just the, um, the, the near Minkowski case. So we show that uh, this, uh, this Calderon problem has a, a unique solution on Lorentzian manifolds uh, with time-like boundary. Uh, if, it's, if, if, if they are sort of close enough to, in a sense, to, to the cylinders in Minkowski space, so first of all, we want to have some global time coordinate. Then we are going to impose a, a curvature condition. And then we have some sort of simplicity condition. So recall that in this, Riem in this Riemannian setting, there is this, uh, there is this notion of simplicity, which is something like no conjugate points and so on. So I'm going to make a sort of Lorentzian analog of, of that here. Uh, so let's make this precise. So, uh, for this first one, for the time coordinate, we assume that there is a smooth surjective function from the manifold uh, to the real line such that its, its, its gradient is, is time-like. This actually guarantees that the manifold is diffeomorphic to this type of infinite cylinder, but it says nothing about the metric, so the metric is not a product ball, um, necessarily. Uh, but, you know, uh, more importantly, it allows us to, to solve the, uh, the classical Cauchy problem for the wave equation on that manifold. So often, uh, you assume that your Lorentzian manifolds are globally hyperbolic in order to have that. But that notion is for manifolds without boundary. So this is like the, the global, I like to think this as global hyperbolicity for uh, manifolds with boundary, with time-like boundary. And this was already used by, let's say, um, Peter Hinz and Günther Ullmann in some of their works related to inverse problems. So I would say this is fairly uh, uncontroversial assumption. Okay, so what about the curvature bound? So 
We have actually two papers about this, uh, this problem. And in the first paper we just assumed uh, uh, a curvature bound that was uh, introduced by Anderson and Howard. And it looks like this. So we have some real number k, and then we look at the curvature tensor of the Lorentzian manifold, and uh, then uh, we say that uh, this r is less than k, so this type of curvature bound is satisfied if uh, this inequality holds for all tangent vectors x and y. Uh, you see, if, if, if instead of a Lorentzian manifold, I had a, a Riemannian manifold here, then this is just a usual sectional curvature bound. Because if you divide this, uh, this factor here on left hand side, oh, sorry, on right hand side, in the parentheses to the left, uh, then uh, what, you, what appears here on the left hand side is just the, the sectional curvature. But um, in, the, in the Lorentzian case, this factor here in the parentheses can actually change sign. And you really want to keep it on this side rather than on the other side. The reason being that if it's on the other side, then you get com basically completely trivial theory. So if you assume a sectional curvature bound in the Lorentzian case, uh, it actually implies that uh, the manifold is, uh, is of constant curvature. Whereas if it's on this other side, uh, then uh, you get the rich theory. Uh, note, note that it's somehow related to the fact that, I mean, if you divide this to the other side, then um, you can actually divide by zero if you're not careful. So in fact, this happens if, if one of these vectors is um, light-like, say y, and, and the other one is orthogonal to this light-like vector. I mentioned this also because um, <coughs> what we actually need to assume, it turns out, or what we did assume in order to get positive result, is, is this curvature bound, but only for vectors of certain type. And in particular, I'm going to take one of the vectors to be always light-like, so then uh, the right-hand side here is always going to be zero. So, so this is really what we need to assume. This is the curvature bound. So we assume that uh, this, this bound holds for all space-like vectors x and light-like vectors n. And this is n to refer to the light-like or null vector. Um, <coughs> and the, the nice thing about this condition is that uh, although it's not, you know, it's not an open condition, if you perturbate a little bit, it might not hold, but you can rescale your, manif uh, you can re rescale your metric conformally so that you, uh, from this, uh, non-strict inequality, you actually get strict inequality, and then you can perturb. So, uh, so especially if you uh, work in some uh, compact region in your, in your cylinder, because I recall that we already made this assumption that forced the manifold to be a cylinder. Uh, <coughs> then on any compact, compact region, we can uh, choose a, a conformal factor such that this becomes strict. And our theory is somehow insensitive to conformal uh, rescalings, as, as you know, I, I, I uh, explained in the beginning that we can always you know, uh, you know, push this to the zero order. Okay, and then, then this uh, strict one, we can, we can, we can uh, perturb, and this somehow gives us, uh, for instance, this near Minkowski result, because of course, uh, in the Minkowski case, uh, both sides are that zero. So, uh, so what about the simplicity? So for that, I need to I need to uh, introduce one more notion. So, uh, so let's uh, let's pick a point on the manifold, and then I call uh, uh, in the description this set E of P is on the exterior of this double uh, uh, cone. So some other the compact region that is within the cylinder and, and outside of this, uh, or bounded by these uh, two conic surfaces. Uh, and this is the set of points that are not uh, causally related to this node in the middle, so the, meaning that there is no causal path from P to Q. And this is somehow the region that is, uh, you know, if you think in terms of general relativity, this is the region 
to which you cannot send a signal from uh, And then we basically assume the, the same uh, condition as in the Riemannian case. So in the Riemannian case, the simplicity was uh, that the exponential map is uh, different morphic, morphism with the whole manifold for any, any base point P. But here we assume this only in this, in this, uh, uh, in this exterior of the no, double null cone together, together with this boundary. So here somehow this, this space-like region is the, uh, the is this E of P and then uh, its boundary is drawn by light like uh, geodesics and we assume that there are no, no cut points on, on, on those um, those uh, geodesics or, or uh, you can reformulate this by saying that uh, you know on the if you go Along, the, along this cone here, this cone surface here. Uh, if I take here one point along the cone surface and I look how I can connect it to this uh, node, then there is only a single light-like path that does the job. And I'll, I mean, the only causal path is, is this, this, uh, it's just this light-like path that goes along the ceiling, uh, along the cone. Okay, so that's somehow the the analog of, 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 of uh, the simplicity condition um, in the Riemannian case. And know that I don't I don't want to do I don't want to assume that something like no conjugate points in this time-like uh, uh, region because that would be you no know, that would extend infinitely far and that assumption would be very strong. Whereas now I'm sort of working in some compact region as in the Riemannian case. Uh, I also assume non-trapping. Uh, this is uh, independent from uh, from other conditions because, I mean, although I'm sort of topologically cylinder, somehow the uh, the cylinder could somehow uh, go to infinity very fast, so that you would have some trapping. So I need to assume no trapping here, and then there is a technical condition. I believe this is not uh, really very uh, important. Maybe with some extra work, we could we could also remove this H5, which is uh, that. All light like geodesics have finite order of contact with the boundary. So this is actually coming from, from our use of some control theory result as a black box. So we are using the famous uh, uh, characterization of exact controllability for wave equations by Bagesleb and Rauch, uh, and they, they assume such a, such a condition. But maybe if you sort of open up the proof and use the fact that we are actually working on the whole boundary, uh, this might be might be removable, but it would require some some work. So why is it spacelike vector? So XP when you do you apply XP to spacelike vectors? Is it, uh, yeah. Why is it spacelike? Uh, XP is uh, is a causal. No, it, you you map. You want to speak about causal causal uh, geodesic? No, causal. no, I'm actually uh, here. I want to speak about really the. So the, sort of the forbidden region, sort of the physically forbidden region. So I'm looking at this compact region in the assumption. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, I'll, I'll explain why this is important. But but uh, yeah, it's maybe somehow unintuitive that mm -hmm. that we are in the non-physical region. Okay. So yeah. So within the, I mean, then this is just the the, the previous formulation of the theorem. So we assume this uh, uh, time-like boundary, global time coordinate. The curvature condition and then the simplicity conditions, and then we can, can solve the, the problem. And this proof is based on a, 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 a new unique continuation result. And then um, using this unique continuation, what we can do is somehow construct uh, the solutions, the in a sense, focus at, at a single point in the manifold, in the sense that if you, you know, restricted them uh, on some time level t naught, then you itself is zero on that level and the time derivative is some uh, constant multiple of, of a delta function at the point. And, um, and then once you can, I mean, once you, if you can uh, uh, construct such uh, focusing solutions, then you can somehow use these to probe your manifold point by point, because these are somehow so sharp to focus. So that's some other very rough idea. And, uh, Maybe I'll go to the next slide to, to make the unique continuation part uh, 
first more precise before saying more. Um, so okay, so so this unique continuation actually works in this uh, set E P. So this is also why it's important that we have you no know, nice nice geometry there. Um, and the, 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 the unique continuation result says that okay, so we have the same geometric assumptions, uh, and then for any uh, any any distribution u in, in some solar space, um, if it's a solution of the wave equation, in fact, you need to assume that it's only solution here in the in the in this uh, exterior of the double Malcolm E of p, and if uh, the the first two boundary traces, so the Cauchy data on the boundary, if you wish vanishes here in the in the sort of well in the in the in the boundary of the cylinder but within this uh, double uh, exterior of the double nalcon uh, then uh, u is actually zero in the whole whole uh, double nalcon so maybe it's actually a good idea to to sketch this in 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 one plus one day just to make sure that we have the same picture in mind so, um, so this is time, and then our cylinder is here. We have some point here, and then I draw the, the double cone, and if the Cauchy data is vanishing here and here. So both you and, and its normal derivative vanish there, so then uh, you get vanishing in this uh, in this region, but not uh, not at the tip, because uh, we are we are considering here some rough solutions that can be uh, you know, like they, they can be like like delta at the tip, and. Um, Okay, so so this is true, and it was known in the in the Minkowski case. Uh, of course, this this follows from also from Tataro's result. If if this potential doesn't depend on time, uh, or if it's real analytic in time, that we have basically the same sort of sharp geometry as in in Tataro's result. But this is is quite different from from Tataro's result, though, uh, because um, you know. We can prove this in this very particular geometry that is somehow global in nature. We, we only prove it for this type of sets and no, no other sets. So this is nothing like we are going through a non-characteristic surface uh, or any non-characteristic surface. But you see, we are here, here really pushing up to the optimal characteristic surface. So this uh, this, this is cold. And, and this, this is also optimal, you know, it's optimal because if you, if you think you are in this rough space, we can put delta source here and the in the in the red point and solve it backward and forward in time, and as such solution will vanish in the in this shaded region here, right? And, and this is important for the proof. So we need in order to carry out somehow the, the inverse problem proof, we need you know, uh, a unique continuation result that is somehow optimal in this sense. So you can all you, you can you, you're able to somehow do do unique continuation as far as it's it's it's, it's, it's possible. So, so in fact, I mean, as I said, we have we have you know, two iterations of the idea, and in the in the first one, we, we didn't quite know, I quite understand what we were doing. Uh, so we, we we proved some column and estimate by hand, and you know it was quite cumbersome. Uh, and and the missing piece in that uh, first work was this uh, conformal rescaling that allows us to somehow win a little bit of convexity, if you wish. And, and now that we have this trick, we can we actually know how to how to prove this unique continuation result just by reduction to to a result a classical result by Hermander. So uh, so the idea is just to to construct a, a pseudo convex foliation here in the in the shaded region. So we want to construct some sort of foliation that looks something like this. So these are like level surfaces of some, some function here.
And then, and then we, you know, tell you a little bit about this this classical result by by Hermann. There. So I mean, of course, if you look at his four volume series and and you open it from uh, volume four, I guess, uh, and this is formulated for some very general class of operators. It's hard to understand and so so forth. But if you specialize it for for wave equation, it's not that hard to understand. So uh, so his his pseudo convexity condition for for the wave operator. And his condition is independent of, of lower order terms, so you just look at the principal symbol essentially. Uh, so, so a function is pseudo convex at, at some point. If uh, for all light like vectors at that point, non zero, uh, you look at, uh, uh, or all light like vectors that are orthogonal to the gradient of the, of the function, the Hessian uh, for those vectors is, is, is strictly positive. And then you can prove this type of local unique continuation result that you know, if we are looking at neighborhood of this point and, and you have wave equation uh, around in that neighborhood and if u is uh, um, zero so the one, on one side of some level surface of f uh, then it's actually zero on the other side as well. And, and signs matter here of course. Uh, you know, we are, if you flip the sign, of course, this will flip, but then also this one will flip. Um, <clears throat> okay, and you know, the guess that sort of a, a flavor what is happening, uh, and in fact, this is basically how we how we approach this uh, this question. Uh, so you can, can actually do something fairly explicit. That I mean, sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. Let me let me just uh, tell you the basic basic thing. Um, so let's just you know uh, choose some normal coordinates and and uh, and then at this at some fixed point the metric looks like a, at that point and then we just define a function like this in this normal coordinate system and this is this is exactly why we want to assume that the exponential map behaves nicely in this space like region so we are going to use this this function in this normal coordinates in this in this region. Uh, and uh, okay, so this this can be called something like a hyperbolic distance function. So it's a bit like distance function, but you flip the, the sign in the time coordinate, and you see, for instance, that this function takes value zero on the on the light uh, on this light cone. Or, uh, also on light, on, on some of, uh, yeah, light cone mapped uh, under the exponential map of that p. And. Um, and then if you, for instance, look how, how this, um, uh, how, what is the Hessian of this function in the Minkowski case? So, so uh, suppose that you are now sort of Minkowski globally and not just it at a single point, and you can compute the Hessian of this guy, and, it, uh, and, and it's just two times the Minkowski metric. So you're, you're sort of almost satisfying this. You, you, you just get zero, right? Because uh, this, this uh, vectors n here are null vectors. If you plug in here two null vectors, of course, you will get zero. Uh, so, I mean, you don't have this positivity, but at least you don't have negativity. <laughs> and uh, then the idea is to do this conformal free scaling to win a little bit. And, and, and this is what, you know, what, what happens in the proof. And maybe if, you, if I explain a little bit more about the proof. So, you see, let's make an analogy to the Riemannian case. So, so if you just look at like a Riemannian distance function. So, you, so suppose that, you know, I flip the sign here in front of my uh, dt, uh, and, and then also here in, 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 in front of, the, uh, of t squared. Th then this is just a usual sort of Riemann Riem distance function in normal coordinates, right? And we know that uh, if you uh, look at the Hessian of this uh, Riemannian distance function, and you sort of follow its evolution along a geodesic, radial geodesic from this point p, it satisfies the Riccati type equation where the forcing term is, 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 the cur is coming from curvature. So uh, you can show that something similar, uh, well, basically the same equation holds for this one. Uh, and this allows us to somehow, you know, get this, uh, sort of propagate some positivity uh, because we make this assumption on the curvature. Well, one needs to still work a bit because, um, you see, we assume that the curvature has a sign We assume that the curvature has a sign, but only in some, you know, certain directions, not in all directions. 
but we also need this uh, Hessian to be positive only in certain directions. So you need to somehow keep track of that in the argument, and that's maybe the, the somehow the well the, the, the sort of the, really the Lorentzian feature in the in the proof and something that is new in the proof. But it, in the end, it boils down to some linear algebra. Okay, um, <clears throat> so that's a. Uh, that's uh, hopefully giving some intuition uh, uh, to the proof. I'll, I'll still, uh, you know, try to uh, give a, a sort of a geometric picture, but, but or an example, a geometric example, of what is happening. So uh, this example is what I called ultrastatic Hall sphere. So it means that I'm looking my Riemannian manifold is just Hall sphere, and then I take product with time interval. So it's it's, it's of this product form, um, and then you know I can just draw some light like geodesics, but, but it's a little bit hard to draw them in all variables simultaneously. But, but here is a, a projection of some light like, I mean, if you're in this ultra -static, static case, the light like geodesics project, if you project them to the Riemannian factor, they just project to Riemannian geodesics. So I have just here some uh, like red circle uh, on, the, on, on the half. Yeah, so this is a projection of some light like geodesic. And you see, I mean, if, if you uh, sort of travel along this blue curve, you are going further and further away from uh, North Pole as you go sort of down here or up there. And, uh, and this is how it looks in, in ordinaries where you look at some of the distance to the to North Pole and, uh, and time. So the light like geodesic looks something like this in those coordinates. I mean, its projection looks like this. Uh, of course, it's sort of also, as you see here, it also sort of rotates in this, in this fire. fire. So, so it's not it's not simple as a Riemannian manifold, but is it simple as a Lorentz? Uh, right. So yeah, I mean, maybe you want to work in not in quite in push the whole house yes. here, but you know, let's in the end you could, you could work in some small neighborhood of the of the North Pole, and then it would be mm -hmm. yeah. Um, but now uh, you can you can also plot the you can plot this function f, this Lorentzian distance function, in this in this geometry. And turns out that it's not pseudo-convex. Uh, because some pseudo-convexity means that if you look at some, so this, this orange curve here is now uh, like a level surface of F. I can project that. In fact, level surfaces of F are rotationally symmetric, so this basically gives whole, whole picture for that surface. Uh, but okay, so this blue geodesic is tangential to the, to the um, orange surface. But now the problem is that this, this pseudo convexity is somehow saying that this, this is not allowed. So the, 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 the geodesic cannot stay on somehow on the wrong side of this surface. So it actually needs to be on the other side for things to be pseudo convex. And uh, so, so in this case, this, uh, this Riemannian distance, uh, sorry, this Lorentzian distance function is somehow uh, is not at all pseudo convex. So we are worse off than even in the Minkowski case where we are at least we are somehow at, uh, at the limiting case. But here, I mean, in this case, you can still construct uh, a pseudo-convex formation, uh, at least if you're working near the, near the North Pole by, you know, instead of considering uh, this, um, you know, you can build it from basically from these blue curves, which are just somehow this, uh, these geodesics, and you sort of just somehow make them surface. I mean, sort of forget one coordinate and then rotate around. And this will be somehow like limiting pseudo-convex as in the as the, the as the Lorentzian distance function is in the in the Minkowski case, and then you can again do some conformal change and gain something. <coughs> but you can also um, and I guess you can you can show that um, you can construct this this by first you know making the conformal uh, change and then. Uh, and then taking just the Lorentzian distance function of this conformal change the metric. So we haven't seen any, you know, so this seems like the most natural mechanism to generate certain convex functions, but, but, but um, yeah, but we are now, um, okay, so there are, there are two things that I want to say. So what we are doing now is we are trying to get rid of this uh, uh, curvature condition, and this, this ultrastatic house sphere somehow gives hope that we can do it because this, you know, um, is not satisfying our, our curvature assumption because if you look at, look at the 
the curvature in Lorentzian space, if it's ultra static, then basically things just automatically project in the Riemannian case. It doesn't have uh, like a non negative, uh, sorry, non positive. So this is a strictly positive curvature, not uh, non positive curvature. Okay, so we are, we are trying to do that, but it is, uh, it has turned out to be quite challenging. And uh, maybe I will still quickly give you uh, a quick idea uh, how, how, how you uh, see this, uh, that this uh, conformal rescaling actually helps. So uh, it's based on some fairly explicit computation, actually. So if we make a conformal change, and now I uh, parameterize this conformal factor using exponential function, uh, you, can, you, can, you can find this formula in Wikipedia. Uh, <laughs> how the curvature tends to change. So this is the so-called uh, cool norming to product here. And, um, you know, for instance, you can, you can check how things work in the Minkowski case. And it uh, turns out that, of course, uh, I mean, this, actually this formula always simplifies a lot if you uh, plug in some null vectors there. Because, for instance, they will kill, I mean, when this n happens to be, uh, happens to hit this slot uh, given by g here, it, it, will, it will go away. <coughs> so it always simplifies, and in the Minkowski case, maybe it simplifies even more. But, um, but in this Minkowski case, you say, see that uh, uh, you get, uh, if you, let's see. I think, uh, yes, so we plug in a function that depends only on the time variable in the Minkowski case, and this is what happens. And you see that this one is always going to be strictly positive as n is null vector, and then you have something that is time-like, so the angle is not going to be zero. And then, you know, uh, you get some factor here, and you can crank it up to be positive. And, you know, that's how, it's a little bit more complicated in the general case, but that gives you somehow like the idea. Okay, so let me, let me stop here. Thanks. Questions? Comments? Can you give some simple examples where all those conditions are satisfied about the Lorentz symmetric? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the perturbation of. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can you can take some um, how do you call it? Like warp products also. I mean, for for some warp products, you can easily compute things, and then you get some uh, examples that are not. That, yeah. And for this uh, unique continuation, there's no hope to make it work if there's some trapping because you need to exhibit some yeah, basically function, the, which is strictly um, Yeah, I mean, there is no hope. Yeah, you're always somehow facing this, this counter example that I have if, if there is trapping because then you can, um, you can construct. Uh, a solution that is somehow you know, concentrated there. I mean, it's, it's very hard to construct a solution that is actually sort of really vanishing. But you see that at least it's not going to be stable. That is easy to understand, right? Mm -hmm. But this construction by Allenhag is actually quite uh, involved, yeah. But that's the basic idea. So if, if, you, if you have a, a, I guess maybe this is the best picture. So if you somehow have a, a, an array that stays just on, the, on one side of, of, of this you know, candidate surface mm -hmm. here, to which you would like to do unique continuation. Uh, then uh, Alin Huck's example, I think, is, is general and says that, you know, I can always choose a potential that prevents the unique continuation. So it's, uh, but, but the potential is complex value, so it's not known if, if, if you can do it, do it with real potential. Yeah. So is the topological structure, uh, that is R cross M0, this cylinder, is it uh, crucial or do you just need a global hyperbolicity? Uh, well, yeah, we need global hyperpolicy, but the question is how to, how to formulate that conven conveniently in the case we have boundary. Okay, so, so probably there is some no other formulation. Yeah. And in the case of, could you consider like some magnetic uh, terms, like, do you think of it? Uh, yes, yes, okay, so uh, I think Sean, Sean, <laughs> Sean is looking into that, yes. <laughs> we, we strongly believe that that's possible. <laughs> With some other, maybe, conditions. Uh, I, I would expect that the geometric conditions are the same. So, uh, so uh, yeah. So if you instead of like box plus b, you would have like box plus first order operator. Uh, I mean, you should. I, I believe that it should be possible to uh, 
modify the technique and, and, and also recover the, the first order perturbation. But of course, then you will have some gauge and it will be a little bit more challenging because you need to sort of gauge equivalences. So yeah, um, maybe Sean can comment that. I mean, you can have a discussion, but, but he's, he's really working with it. Yeah. Okay, so maybe uh, we thank a lovely rain. And...